So Adam, welcome to the Personal Finance Podcast. Andrew, I'm excited to be here, excited to talk about our topic today. So I'm really excited to talk about this too, because you have a very creative way to build wealth. And it's something I really haven't thought about before, but I think it's a really cool methodology that you've built out here. So I'm really, really excited to talk about this. But before we jump in, I just want to make sure that everybody is clear on one subject, because it is one of the focal points of this system, and it's utilizing a HELOC. So can you give us an explanation of what a HELOC is? Yeah, I sure can, Andrew. A HELOC, is it stands for a home equity line of credit. And when we talk about HELOCs today, one of the things that uh, may come up as a question for listeners is, can you use any line of credit? And the, the simple answer is yes. So this could be a B-lock, a business line of credit, or a P-lock, a personal line of credit. The key is that the line of credit and how this functions is that it, it really is like a two-way street. You can borrow money against a HELOC and you can put money in a HELOC. So it functions like a checking account, but the difference is that we're, we're actually borrowing money from that line of credit. A HELOC in particular is just tied to your home's equity, right? Which is how it gets the name HELOC, home equity line of credit. Absolutely. And that is the perfect explanation. I think it's one of those things that um, a lot of people u- utilize to do things like buy liabilities. But for a lot of people, you can actually build wealth with a HELOC, which is why I absolutely love your system and, and kind of going through this process. So your system is called the shred method. Um, and the shred method is something that I think is very unique that nobody really talks about. So you're the first person I've actually heard talk about this system. So can you give us like a bird's eye view of what the shred method actually is? Yeah. So the bird, the bird's eye view of the shred method, uh, Andrew, is this. We believe that, that typically people's income is not efficient. It's not being used efficiently. And I like to give, uh, I like to speak in metaphors. So I'm going to give you a metaphor for what the shred method actually is. Um, Andrew, if you were to leave your home in the morning at like 8 a.m. and you go to the grocery store and then you come back home knowing that you're going to go to the post office at 4 p.m., would you leave your car idling in the driveway all day long? Absolutely not. Why not? A, I don't want to, to waste money on gas. B, I don't want it to get stolen. <laughs> okay, very good. Yeah. And I hear from other people, it'd be hard on the environment, hard on the car's engine, right? Wasteful, all these things. Well, this fundamentally is what people do with their income. They use it you know, on the 1st, maybe on the 7th, maybe on the 12th. But in the meantime... The income just sits there in their checking account or their savings account for days and weeks, in some cases, months or years on end. All the while, they are inefficiently burning uh, interest cost on other high interest expenses. And that could be credit cards, it could be student loans, it could be car loans, or it could be your mortgage, which candidly is the highest interest bearing uh, debt that most people will have in their lifetime. Absolutely. I think that's a perfect bird's eye view as well. And I think it's, this is one of those things where the thing, the cool thing about this is, is you've kind of flipped the script on what a house can be. Because a lot of times people utilize their house and it actually is a liability if you kind of look at some of the costs and expenses that go through um, owning a house. But this kind of turns your house into somewhat of an asset. So how can this actually kind of flip the script and turn your house from a liability into an asset? Well, you know, I read the book, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and the Cashflow Quadrant, as, as many of your listeners probably have as well, and I'm sure you did, Andrew. Yep. And Robert Kiyosaki always said that an asset puts money in your pocket and a liability takes money out of your pocket. And using that logic, your home, your primary residence would be a liability. It takes money out of your pocket. And I started looking at it wondering, how could I use it as an asset? Meaning, if I have equity in my home, what could I be doing with that equity that would actually get me closer to where I want to be. And there's there's two fundamental things at play here, Andrew. Number one is that if you do if if you play the bankers play by the bankers rules, and I'm not vilifying bankers because they need to make money too, but if you play by the bankers rules, we, the consumer, are their compound interest vehicle. Does that make sense? It does. So when we, we borrow money from the bank, we become the vehicle that allows them to make money using compound interest. And I started challenging that notion that if I just dutifully make the payment, just like the banker always tells me to, or the agreement that I've signed up front, um, they are signing over this amount of money to me at this particular interest rate, knowing that they're going to make a significant profit on the money that's that's loaned. So how would I reorient my cash flow to make sure that I could blast away debt in record time. And then instead of paying them 
copious sums of interest. You know, for most people, it's tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars over the course of their lifetime. What if those tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars could be deployed into cash flow producing assets, which could be real estate, syndications, could be intellectual property plays. We've got a, a deal right now going where we're investing in ATM tranches, uh, you know, that generate a, a significant cash flow year over year. So this is what we started realizing was the equity in our home actually has value, but only if we unlock that value in the form of liquidity or a line of credit to deploy somewhere else where we can get a better than average return on it. And I absolutely love that way of thinking because I think it's one of the most valuable things that you can do with your home equity is be able to utilize it to buy more assets. So that's so cool that you have some of these funds get putting together to buy all these different assets uh, to go through that process. As One big thing for the Shred Method is you essentially are using your HELOC as a checking account. And this is one thing I really had to, if you're used to using your just a traditional checking account to funnel money through, it's one thing that you kind of have to have a mindset shift on. Um, so can you talk about why this is so important to be able to utilize your HELOC as a essentially your checking account when you go through this method. Yes. And this is such a profound question, Andrew, because um, I believe that most people don't have an income problem. They have a liquidity problem. Yeah. And what I mean by that is the income problem for most people is not there because whatever they've bought, whatever they've acquired, the payments that they're making, they can afford the payments, but they don't have the liquidity to blast away the debt or to invest in lump sums. Mm -hmm. And so what we're really trying to do is we're trying to get to a point where people have liquidity sufficient that they can do the kind of investments that we're talking about. And by and large, the, the challenge for most consumers is that they have paymented themselves into a corner so they can afford their payment, but only up to whatever their income is. And then, you know, they, they got to wait till Friday to get paid again, to go do anything with it. When we use the HELOC as a checking account, Think about what happens when you free up, you know, call it 500, 1,000, 5,000, $15,000 in liquidity, and you drop that down on one of your debts that knocks out the debt right away and frees up that amount of cash flow. Or in the case of your mortgage, uh, and this is really fundamental to how the shred method works. If you were to buy a home and you make payment one, you know, as well as I know, and many of your listeners probably do as well, that the the lion's share of the interest that you're paying on your mortgage is up front it's it's the way that the mortgage is built right so you are you are paying whatever the balance of your mortgage is the interest on that amount in arrears 30 days and as a result you know if you had a 1500 dollars mortgage payment 1300 and change might be going to interest where only 180 goes to principal right but if you dropped 5,000 or 10,000 or $15,000 down on that mortgage right away, you would skip from payment one all the way down to payment, let's say 47 or 62, thereby passing over five years of mortgage payments just like that, right? And in, in the passing over of five years of mortgage payments, you skip all of that interest that you would have paid otherwise, which if it's on average, I mean, let's just say for simplicity's sake, it's $1,000 every payment. You just skip 62 payments in this example, let's say that's $62,000 in interest. You're not going to pay on the mortgage. And so we're just, we're showing people how to effectively game the amortization table of your mortgage while creating access to the liquidity that's locked in your home to be able to then go do intelligent things with it. And this is key. It's not about spending, right? You mentioned this before. We're not buying doodads. You're not buying four wheelers here. We're trying to build wealth using this method. Exactly. And that is one of the cool things. And people who are listening, if they listen to this podcast for a long time, they know we talk about this all the time, how your mortgage is actually front loaded, just to reiterate what Adam is saying. So this is the most powerful part about this is you're skipping that front loaded interest so that you can kind of move along with your mortgage and you just pay it off that much faster. It compounds that much faster. So it's an amazing way to get it paid down. Um, so that is one of the coolest things with this as well. So if you somebody wants to do this and say they bought a house um, and maybe they bought it a couple of years ago, maybe they bought it in the mm -hmm. last year, how much equity do you have to have available to be able to, to go through this system? Well, that's I think that's the magic of this, Andrew. You don't need significant, significant equity to make it work. Um, it's really based, our system is based on an algorithm and the algorithm calculates inputs like, 
how much income do you have coming in? One of the inputs that you plug into the system is your expenses, your debts, your mortgage payment, investments you're making, savings you're putting away, those kinds of things. Um, but, but what is really at stake here is how much discretionary money do you have at the end of a two week pay period or at the end of the month that is either sitting there idly in your account, or maybe it's going somewhere into, you know, a lot of people have a sinking fund as an example. And I'll give you a prime uh, case study of someone that was doing this. And then we showed them the shred method, created efficiencies and boom, they're, they're out of debt in no time. Um, but back to your original question, how much do you need? For most people today getting into a home, they're going to have somewhere between five and 20% equity already because they're going to put five to 20% down, right? You need somewhere around five to 10% equity to really make this work well. Now, when I say that, it's also based a little bit on your income. So if you're making $5,000 a month take home, ideally what you need is somewhere between three and 73 grand and 7,500 in equity to, to take advantage of a HELOC of that amount so that it has, your income has some place to go, right? You can't make five grand a month and have a $4,000 line of credit. Cause when you make the deposit, a HELOC can only ever be zero or negative. It's never going to go positive. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. So that's perfect. So, so it's, it's, you don't need a ton of equity there. If, even if you bought a house and then, you know, the last couple of years, you, you will have some equity most likely, um, depending on yep. where you live in that house. So you can have that, um, you can kind of get started with this depending on how much equity you have pretty much right away for most people. Absolutely. And, and, you know, furthermore, if someone doesn't have the equity to, to go and tap right away in a home equity line of credit, Obviously, I mentioned you could get a P lock, a personal line of credit. You could get a B lock, business line of credit that'll do the same thing. Or you can use an emergency savings fund or sinking funds or a discretionary fund that you have. Could be called an opportunity fund. And and this is the caveat. I'm not I'm not proposing that people go sink all their money in. Right? There ought to be an amount of money that you have available and accessible to you all the time. But if you've got five grand in addition that you know you won't touch right away, we could turn that into the shred fund and make it work. And over the course of call it 60 days, 90 days, 120 days, you'll have more than enough equity that you could then go get a HELOC to fully uh, engage the system. I love that. So it's it's really accessible to most people um, within that situation. And you could probably get some of those loans even without having you know a mortgage and some equity on that. So along those same lines, can you utilize the shred method on other types of debt, things like student loans, maybe credit card debt or auto loans? You absolutely can. Um, in fact, you know we encourage people look looking at uh, if you have significantly high student loan debt, if you have uh, you know a car loan that's that that. I mean, car loans are a little bit different situation, Andrew, because sure. most of them, right? If you've gotten a car in the last six to 12 months, interest rates were like 1.9%. They've obviously gone up since, since then. And when this recording will come out, um, but what we, we attempt to tackle are the higher interest debts first that have some significant payment. So that could be a student loan. It's likely going to be a credit card, but when we go after those, what we're doing is we're shredding the debt. And we're freeing up whatever the monthly amount that was being paid on that debt. In effect, what we're doing is we're, we're using a debt snowball, but we're using a debt snowball. If, if you were to put the snowball analogy in a gas tank, the shred method, the shred method is like putting nitrous oxide in that gas tank, right? It just happens that much faster. And so, yes, in answer to your question, you can go after those debts. We encourage you going after those debts. Um, the only difference is that with a mortgage, you, you are actually building equity in something where when you're shredding your student loans, we're just literally getting rid of a debt that's, that's been hanging over your head. So we may not have that asset necessarily tied to it. And there's, there's a little bit of coaching that goes along with the shred method and our clients where we'll walk through your entire scenario and then plan with you what makes the most sense to tackle first, second, third, and so on. Um, in an effort to create more freedom for our, for our members. Cause that's, that's why we exist. I love that. So it's one of those things where, especially on higher interest rate debt, 
that's one thing we talk about always that we want to get paid down so that we can kind of accelerate our path to wealth. And this helps us do that in a much faster way, which I absolutely love. So I know this question is one that I'm asking because I know a lot of people will ask me after the fact, after we have this episode, yeah. are there any tax implications um, for running your finances this way? Uh, I love this question because typically where it's rooted is in what if I lose my mortgage interest deduction? Right. And in 2017, there was some tax law changes. And essentially what happened was individuals and couples are now able to do a standard deduction of 12, five per person, <clears throat> excuse me, or $25,000 per couple as a standard deduction. So if you are deep enough into your own taxes that, you know, you itemize and your itemization goes above 25,000, first of all, kudos to you because you're far deeper in the tax game than I want to be. Um, but secondly, you'd have to have a, a five, six, seven hundred thousand dollar mortgage at five, six, seven percent in order to have enough interest to then itemize. So if you've got a moderate mortgage and you're looking at how much interest you're paying on an annual basis, if it is less than twenty five thousand dollars, there is no tax benefit for you to keep your mortgage for a long time. Uh, the government's already given you a gift of a standard deduction of twenty five thousand. So that, that excuse, that reason for, you know, why I'm going to keep my, my mortgage for a good long time, that kind of goes out the window. Um, you know, as for taxes going through, you know, a, a change in taxes, running your income through this system, it doesn't really change at all. Um, the one, one of the major advantages, not the one, but one of the, ma the major advantages is we tend to operate with a credit card and we'll tell our members that, Every charge you make, every, every ounce of spending that you're going to do throughout the month is going to go on a card, but you're going to pay it off every single month with the HELOC. So we're, we're actually using the card for points and miles and bonuses and all that stuff. So one of the things that my wife and I have noted, and many of our clients have experienced is that Christmas ends up being free or traveling uh, at the end of the year. We want to go somewhere. We just go somewhere for free because we have lots of points, lots of miles, uh, you know, lots of bonuses through Amex or our, our city card or wherever we choose to use it. Um, but from a tax perspective, there really aren't any added liabilities or, or challenges to using the system. That's awesome. And I think that's the perfect explanation with the credit card side here. We are so pro travel hacking that that's going to be absolutely perfect for some of our listeners as well. Cause that's one big thing that we love to talk about here as well. So that is perfect. So one big thing is, I know this is for a lot of people, and it's going to work for a lot of people. And then one quick question I have is, who is this methodology not for? Are there people out there that this just would not work for them? Yes, is a short answer. Um, you know, I often tell people, Andrew, that this is for everyone, but not everyone's going to do it or, or going to do it effectively. Um, I will say this right off the bat. It is not for someone who is who who does not have discipline with their money, meaning you you have more uh, there is more month at the end of your money, not more money at the end of your month. You know, so if, if you have more month at the end of your money, this is not for you because the system only works if you have discretionary money. And our goal is to create efficiencies with that discretionary money so that you can pay less and less in interest, less and less in expenses and expand how much discretionary money you have at the end of every month. Um, it is not for someone. Now, this is there's a little bit of a of a qualifier here. It is not for someone who has radically inconsistent paychecks. So it's, it's best if you know consistently what your paychecks are going to be, because the system is, is calculating that using the algorithm and the inputs. And it's looking out over the course of 45 to 60 days saying, based on the income, based on the expenses, here are the lump sums you're going to pay in, right? Using the HELOC. So if you have inconsistent income, maybe you're, you're a business owner, as an example, uh, or maybe you're a realtor, one of the things that I recommend people do who are in that state is can you figure out a way to pay yourself evenly every two weeks, right? You may have peaks and valleys in your income, but can you pay yourself evenly um, so that you can use the shred method? And this is exactly what I did in my business. I made my living as a professional speaker for years and I would have big months and I would have lean months. And on the really big months or the lean months, I still paid myself the same amount. So it allowed us to use shred as a tool and it was all very consistent and predictable. We would just do bonuses or settle up every quarter. And that allowed us to make even bigger lump sum payments to knock out our mortgage and or 
invest in something else, you know, each time that happened. And I could not agree more with folks who who are business owners who have inconsistent income as well. It's the the best thing to do is make sure that you can pay yourself under kind of what you're making every single month, and then at the end of the year, give yourself so, yourself those lump sums. That's what we do with all of our businesses as well. It's a lot easier to manage cash flow, but in addition, it's going to help you with with situations like this, which is perfect. Um, so I absolutely love that. Yeah. Sidebar on that, Andrew. I've seen too many people that, uh, and I use realtors as an example only because I have a number of them who are friends but they would have a huge month, you know, list and sell two or three homes. And they do, a, you know, they do 60, 80 grand in commissions. They go out and buy the, the new Tahoe because they're like, it's been a great month. I'm going to go treat myself. And then they're zeros for the next three months. And they're freaking out about what the money is. And I was like, you know, if you just annualized all of that and said, I'm going to pay myself six grand a month or four grand a month or whatever the number you need to make it work. Because then quarterly or semi-annually, you'd go back in and go, oh, I've got a big chunk of money in there. I'll just do a dividend or a distribution. Um, that's, that's honestly when this system works like magic. If you're a business owner and you've got periodic chunks of money throughout the year, this is like a video game you can't lose when you do it well. Exactly. I could not, I could not agree more. And even those large chunks, once you get all this debt paid down, even those large chunks, you could invest those dollars too. And we know large lump sums are really going to propel and accelerate your path to wealth when you're investing your money. So I love that. Um, so another big thing here is learning how to do this with a partner. So a lot of people who own homes, um, maybe they have a partner or a spouse who they own that home with. So how do you kind of get your partner or spouse on board with something like this red method? Yeah, man, it's such a good question because I think, um, obviously money, money issues, differences in money mindset is probably one of the greatest reasons that partnerships fail and marriages fail. And I was lucky enough that my wife and I got on the same page financially years and years ago. Um, candidly, we read a book called Smart Couples Finish Rich by David Bach. And in that book, David Bach talked about women and men have different risk tolerances. And one of the th questions that he encouraged couples to ask each other is, how much do you need in savings to feel safe and secure at any given point in time? And when I asked my wife that, we were young, a young, young couple, maybe a year or two into our marriage. And I asked her, hey, honey, how much do you need in, in savings to feel safe and secure? And she said $20,000. And I thought she'd hit the Listerine too hard that morning. You know what I mean? Because I was like, that is an insane amount of money to have in a money market account. She's like, you asked. So in answer to your question, Andrew, I think that the way to get a, to, to get a couple or you know a, a spouse or a partner on board with you on this is number one, have really honest discussions about what keeps you up at night around money. Because some people is, our bills are really high. And if your bills are really high and you freak out about that, well, the shred method has an answer because your bills are gonna go down, 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 down over a period of time. If somebody says, I'm just freaked out that if an, if an, uh, an emergency happens, we're not going to have enough money to cover it, which ultimately is a how much in savings do you need kind of question. But as you use the shred method and you're creating more and more and more equity in your property, you have more liquidity on that line of credit. So if your house needs a new roof, the water heater goes out, the car breaks down, kids need braces. And you're like, well, where's this five grand going to come from? Boom. It comes from the HELOC because we've been using it really efficiently and effectively. Remember earlier on, I said, if you drop, I think I used 15 grand as the example, you drop 15 grand in and it drops you down to payment 62 from payment one and you just save $60,000, guess what? That's where the braces come from. So we don't have to sweat the expenses because we're using our income really, really efficiently, taking money, pulling money back from the banker. Like I don't wanna make my banker's Lexus payment. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to circumvent how much interest is paid and then leverage what I need on that HELOC because I've created liquidity and equity for myself. I love that. And I think that communication side of it, what keeps you up at night is one of the best questions that you can ask. I actually have that book by David Bach on my shelf and I haven't read it yet. I buy too many books. And so it's, it's sitting on my shelf, but I'm definitely going to read that now. Cause I, I kind of want to go through that. Um, highly, and highly encouraged with a spouse chapter by chapter. You read chapter one, she reads chapter one, they read chapter one. Two, two, go back and forth and then discuss it. Because one of the things that came out of it for us was too many people, too many couples have one person that makes all the financial decisions and the other one's completely in the dark. And what happens is either a weird dynamic is created 
and or something happens to the one spouse that's been making all the decisions and the other one's like, I have no idea where any of this stuff is located. And so um, David Bach walks you through, here's the file folder structure. Here's where you keep things. Here's how we do passwords. All of that is critical. Um, and you, you know, young people especially don't really think about it. Like well, I'm going to be around forever, but I've, I've heard way too many stories of something happening. And then the surviving spouse is just like, I'm lost. I have no idea where any of this was. I love that. And it gives you actionable advice on that as well. I'm definitely going to go through that. And we'll link that book up down below as well. So everybody can check that out if they're interested in it. Um, Cause I think it's one that we'll definitely go through for sure. So one big thing here um, is that some people may say that, when they don't, when they misconstrue the math on this, they may say, well, it makes more sense to invest my money than to pay off yep. my mortgage and my interest rate somewhere, you know, three, 4%, somewhere in that range. Yep. So how does the shred method actually flip this equation because of the accelerated payoff? As I mentioned at the beginning that this is for everyone, but not everyone will do it. And I've met a lot of people, Andrew, that will say I can make more money in the market. And to them, I typically respond. I don't doubt that you can, I really don't. Um, but my question is, have you? Look at, look at the last year, look at the last two years. Are you up at the kind of level that you could be, or are you just banking on the fact that over the last hundred years, the S and P 500 has made eight to 10% on average and blah, blah, blah. And I, and I don't, I don't fault anyone who has that logic. Cause I, I believe in it. Um, but what I will tell you is that my wife and I, um, and again, another metaphor here, Andrew, for, for you and your listeners, you know, how, a, how an atomic bomb goes off. Yep. Do you remember this? That like the, the, the atom cloud. like co collapses yep. in on itself. Yep. And the energy and the collapse, the co collapsion, is that a word? The collapsing of the atom on itself or the nucleus on itself just explodes out. I am no uh, physicist, but that's my understanding of it. What I started to think about was if I have really sufficient uh, discretionary income and I could blast away my mortgage in, let's say, two years or two and a half, three years. And my wife and I have done it twice now in the last seven years. The first time was 3.8 and the second time was 2.7 years. Knocked out, completely done. The second mortgage we knocked out in 2.7 years was $200,000. So we would knock our mortgage out. And then when interest rates were where they needed to be, we would cash out refi 200 grand and go drop them in syndications or, or rental real estate or wherever. And then we would proceed to shred it again. So in the course of 2.7 years, we shred that debt. And what happens when we did that, it was like the nucleus collapsed on itself. And when we exploded our wealth, then when we exploded out, we could go out and drop a hundred grand here, a hundred grand here, 200 grand here. And the end result of that was way more cash flow, way higher interest rate deals because we're buying wholesale, not retail. And the issue that I have with people who say, I could just dollar cost average invest and I'll make far more money over time. You may. And, and in the, the, you know, the law of compound interest says it's the last few doublings that are going to make you a ton of money. But what if you can get to a compound interest inflection point far faster than you would if you were just, if you were just dollar cost average investing. And, and I don't, I don't proclaim to, to be a genius or a guru on this at all. Cause it's only been my experience and the experience of some of our clients. But when we go like this to expenses and collapse them to next to nothing, but our income keeps growing, our ability to invest bigger and longer and faster is there far more than the people who are just like, oh yeah, I'm putting my money in month after month after month. And someday it will grow. We're looking at these numbers like, holy cow, we're going to drop X amount in next year. And our clients are doing the same. They're like, I can't believe that I wasn't doing this before when I can put 25 grand in an account just like that. Right. Cause that's, that's the power. That's the, that, that is the liquidity challenge that people have not an income problem. It's a liquidity problem and we're helping to resolve the liquidity problem. So that's my description. That's my explanation of, uh, you know, those that say I could make more money in the market. You may be able to, however, over the next five years, 10 years, whatever it's going to look like, Will it go sideways and can you make money in a sideways market? I mean, if you're uh, selling puts and trading, you know, trading options and doing futures, more power to you, but that feels kind of risky for some. Um, this, this can be like a more, from my perspective, a more guaranteed way of building wealth and seeing it grow fast 
in a short amount of time. And I can think of so many practical applications for that too, as well. Just thinking through someone maybe who's investing $500 a month, for example, into something like an index fund and they yeah. go through that process, but instead you could kind of get this mortgage pay down, accelerate that process. And all of a sudden you have all this additional cash flow. And in like three, four, five, six years, whatever that is, then all of a sudden you're investing say 2,500 a month instead. So that acceleration is, is massive. And then over time, it's yep. just going to compound. Um, and you're going to have more and more money, especially as your income grows, which is the biggest part of the equation. Um, and totally. what we talk about on this podcast all the time, because I think income just solves so many problems. Um, yeah. So as your income rises, if you can keep that income, keep your expenses low, you're really going to see that accelerated side and that accelerated payoff. Well, and in addition, I can see so many uses for this in real estate investing as well. So we talk about real estate investing all the time on here. Um, and I can see so many different uses for that as well to accelerate paying down houses. If you have a big group of um, houses that are paid off that you shredded those mortgages on those. I mean, the, the amount of wealth that you can build every single month is just an amazing snowball. Oh man. I mean, whether you're talking about doing a, a cash out refi when it makes sense to do that again, or you're, you, you know, you can cross collateralize four or five properties and get a line of credit on those that could be four or $500,000, a million dollars. Imagine what happens when you're, you know, you're at the auction block, which unfortunately may happen here soon. And you're picking up foreclosure deals and it's just like, uh, I'm making cash offers because I can write a check out of my HELOC and pick up whatever I want. You know, that's the power of this really. And it takes, it takes a little bit of time, Andrew. It's not, this isn't an overnight thing, right. but you know, I've been on a couple of podcasts and they talk about crockpot wealth. You know, we're talking about crockpot wealth with a little bit of a, of a microwave feature to it. Cause we're going to microwave it quick and then go crockpot this thing to, to massive, you know, massive abundance over time. Absolutely. I love that. I love that analogy too. Crockpot, well, sl slow and steady all the way across um, yep. as we start to build wealth. So I love that. So here's another big one, because I think this is one where we get a lot of questions um, sent in to us about HELOCs. And when people talk about HELOCs, maybe they do like a home improvement project. So say, for example, yep. maybe they put in a pool for a hundred grand. Uh, they pulled a HELOC out to go ahead and do that. So say somebody did that and maybe they have some equity um, that they built out of that HELOC. So maybe they have like 80,000 on their HELOC, but they can, you know, pull a hundred grand. Um, sure. does that work for someone in that situation if they already have that existing HELOC or would it not work for someone in that situation? It does work for someone in that situation. It actually, the, we have a piece of software that powers the shred method. So when I talk about the algorithm, it literally is an algorithm that's calculating, you know, how much is available, how much is coming in, how much is going out and what would you then need to leverage at any point in time in order to get yourself out of debt or, uh, to, to create more efficiency, uh, efficiency with your income. So in a case that you just described hundred grand HELOC, 80 grand on it, you would have ostensibly $20,000 sitting there. And what we often consult with our clients about is, Hey, let's not, let's not deploy the whole thing. Let's put 12 or 13 grand, 15 grand max in the system that you can use to shred with so that you always have $5,000 in liquidity in case you need it in case of an emergency, but that, you know, that 10, 12, 15 grand that's there available to you, you're going to be able to use that to shred some of the, the debt, whether it's your mortgage, car, uh, credit card, student loans, what have you. Um, the, the one difference that I would add to this, Andrew, is that I would, I would educate those people on their income actually needs to be cycling through the HELOC. So the challenge for most folks is they go get a HELOC to build a pool in this case, but they treat that HELOC as a home equity loan because that HELOC or loan is going to have a payment attached to it. Generally, it's going to be either interest only, or it will be a 1% of whatever the balance is, right? And so on a monthly basis, they're going to make that minimum payment or maybe a little bit more. But now the HELOC just feels like this oppressive thing that I got to pay off because I got 80 grand sitting out there. When your income is cycling through it, it's going to go up and it's going to go down because you're paying bills out of it. But by and large, it's trending down if you have discretionary income. And furthermore, we're paying less and less in interest as it trends down every single month, which is our ultimate goal. So for again, this is like showing the caveman fire for some people when we show them how it works. But um, when your income is cycling in, the interest that is charged against the HELOC is charged on the average daily balance. It's not like a mortgage, which is charged on the balance at the end of the previous month. So they're looking at over 30 days time. What was the average amount you had on that HELOC? Remember it was going up and down because of your income, but the average was this. 
So it's going to be less than you might imagine. And this, this is really where the, you know, it's not magic, it's math. When we start to show people the math of it, they go, oh, I didn't realize how little interest I was actually being charged on my HELOC because I borrowed 10 grand against it, but I dumped seven grand in over two payments. So it was up and then it was down, it was up and then it was down. But over the month it was here. So I was only charged like tens of dollars in interest for the month, but I saved hundreds or thousands of dollars in interest on my mortgage by applying it correctly. That's perfect. And I think that's the absolute perfect explanation for that because I think that's one thing I know people would be wrestling with because there are people that have asked a number of questions on that. Um, yeah. And I think that would be kind of kind of stressful them to see it kind of go up and then down. But over time, if you're doing this the right way, it's obviously going to go down over time. And that interest, you know, the, the interest on that will be reduced um, over time as well. So that is that is a perfect explanation on that. So I want to shift gears here because we have a couple of questions that we ask a lot of our guests. Um, yeah. and so I would love to, to ask you a couple of these as well. So the first one is what part of your work or life makes you come alive? Well, I mentioned before that I've been a public speaker, built my career on you know, presenting and, and being in front of groups and nothing makes me come alive more than, uh, seeing people's eyes light up when they get a concept, when they get an idea, when they get that one thing that's like, oh my gosh, if I do this, my life will turn around, or I'm going to do this one thing differently for the rest of my life. And I, I have told people that my hope on my deathbed and or at my funeral is that there is a parade of people walking by my, my family saying, I, I learned this one thing from Adam and it changed my life. Um, and a buddy of mine calls them life gate moments that when you go through the life gate, your life has never been the same. I want to show people life gate moments. That's what makes me come alive. And for me, candidly, Andrew shred is it. When I learned this, I was like, how can I not teach this to people? It's such a profoundly simple concept. Folks are using it in various parts of the country or in the, of the world, but we're not, and we're not because we've just been ingrained by the banking system. So what makes me come alive is, is aha moments and life gate moments for people. I love that term life gate moments. I'm going to use that in the future, I think, because that's a really cool way to think through it as well. So, um, the second one is what is the best advice about money that you've ever received? One of the best pieces of advice I ever received was there is a difference between taking a calculated risk and being risky. And I have taken that to heart in virtually everything that I've done because it would be risky to go into something that I know nothing about and dump a ton of money in, or I could take a very calculated risk by listening to shows like yours and doing my due diligence before I get into an investment by listening to every single thing that person has put out or reading every book I could find about it before I go do it. Um, I have found that, that when I take a calculated risk, they generally pay off when I am risky, they generally don't. And, and, um, it's something that I've taught my kids. I've tried to teach college students and young professionals everywhere that there is a big difference between being risky and taking a calculated risk. And if you can weather the calculated risk, go do it. But if it's risky and you're, you're risking losing the money, you'll likely lose it. I love that. It's kind of like the old Warren Buffett adage where he just doesn't invest in anything he doesn't understand. And that's kind of one of the principles here as well is, is you've got to understand what you're doing, understand the risk, what your risk tolerance is, all those other things. So I love that. Um, the it's third one is my well favorite. For Warren, you know? Exactly. I think it worked out pretty well for him. <laughs> just exactly. So the, the next one is my favorite one of all. So it is one that we get a different answer pretty much every time. And it's one that um, we've gotten some pretty cool answers. So what does wealth mean to you? Mm. Well, I, I'm a big proponent of the wealth score and wealth score in my perspective and in my community is if your current income stopped tomorrow, how long could you live your current lifestyle? So if you're, if you're earned, and I say earned income, really, if your earned income stopped tomorrow, how long could you live your current lifestyle? Passive income is going to keep coming and that's all gravy, right? But if your earned income stopped tomorrow, how long could you live your current lifestyle? Meaning you're going to deplete all of the reserves and assets you have. How long could you live? This to me, Andrew, is the, is the measure that most people are trying to get to with quote unquote retirement. And, you know, the financially independent retire early community would say, okay, I just need to get to this number. And then a 4% burn rate gets me wherever, right? 
But I'm saying if that income stopped, because what if you can't draw 4%, maybe your growth isn't sufficient. How long could you last with the amount of money you have or the passive income you have if current income stopped tomorrow? And unfortunately for most people, they'd be like uh, Sunday at 3 p.m. That's how long they could last. And we, my wife and I have really, uh, we have played this game well where we're looking out going, hey, at this point, we could last well into our 70s. We could last, you know, in every single year or month, we'll, we'll look at it and go, hey, we added three months or we added a year to our number. We added five years to our number. Um, our goal is to get to a point where we're going to supersede our lifespan by 10 or 15 or 20 years. And at that point, now we're just empire building. Let's get to a point where we're, we're creating, you know, A, massive, passive, permanent streams of income and B, let's create a Rockefeller type fortune for the next generations, not just our kids, but our grandkids and great grandkids, because I think we can using the logic that we're, we're using. I absolutely love that. And it's like the ultimate safety net is what you're kind of creating here, which is um, one of those things that then you can utilize that to be able to to take more aggressive moves and, and be able to build wealth that much faster. So I absolutely love that. So Adam, thank you. This was an amazing conversation. I'm so excited for people to hear about this. We're going to link up the shred method down below um, so you guys can check that out. But Adam, where else can people find you and everything you have going on with the shred method and everything else that you're doing? Yeah. Uh, well, the best place to go, Andrew, is theshredmethod.com. That would be a great place to go check out. We have a savings calculator. There's a HELOC guide that you can download. And um, uh, as well as an evergreen webinar you can watch that talks about the shred method and goes through the detail and the numbers. Um, if you want to find out more about me, you can go to Adam Carroll, C-A-R-R-O-L-L.info. And on my site, there is information about me from a speaking perspective. I have a TED talk with about 6 million views. I did a documentary on student loan debt some years ago uh, that's available out there. So there's a lot of great content there, but adamcarroll.info or theshredmethod.com are the two sites. Well, fantastic. We'll link all of those up down below in the show notes as well. Adam, thank you so much for coming on. This was so fun. Andrew, my pleasure. Thanks for having me.